Thank you for joining Pathway to 17 Summit. My name is Tari Ronimo, and I will be your moderator for the Future of Social Payments uh, session. Um, I am the CDFP program lead and also deputy director. I have today a really, really exciting panel, and we're going to have uh, such, a, such a great conversation. I will introduce all of them briefly until before we get into the actual session. So I'll start with Milka Chiebi, a senior social protection payment specialist from FSD Kenya, welcome. Ashley Onyango, head of financial inclusion in Agritech, mobile for development, GSMA, welcome. Daikola Alabi, chief innovation officer, Sabi Africa, welcome to you. And last, but definitely not least, Michael Scott, Group Head of Commercial from Mukuru. Thank you very much. So um, our time is quite limited and we have such a great conversation to get through. Um, I'm going to start asking the questions and I'll direct my first question to you, Ashley. The World Bank estimates that 215 countries implemented new social protection programs in 2020. This is 2020 where social protection was so critical. We had so many setbacks and um, it's estimated that we lost five years of, uh, of, of moving towards getting people out of poverty. Can you please tell us from a mobile money point of view, what sort of, um, what are the growth patterns that you saw during this period, maybe in terms of uh, government to pay to person payments. And we're looking at it because it's the GSMA. So if we could get like a global view um, of the growth trends. Yeah, absolutely, Turo. Um, certainly we all saw and witnessed that during the pandemic governments around the world distributed monetary and fiscal support to their citizens. Um, I think the World Bank noted that it was 186 countries have sent $1.25 trillion directly to their citizens, and about one in six humans around the world have been a recipient of this. Um, so I think it's important to note on the mobile money trend that you know, governments in low and middle income countries had to really turn to mobile money providers to distribute financial support to, to their citizens. Through the digital infrastructure of mobile money, many were able to set up payment systems to overcome daunting obstacles and really surpassed in some ways those of their wealthier counterparts. Um, a good example of this is in Togo. It was a, it's a nation of about 8 million people where the average income is below $2 a day. It took the government less than two weeks to design and launch an all digital system for delivering monthly payments to about a quarter of their adult population. But to answer your question specifically on growth, so the number of people receiving government to person payments through mobile money quadrupled during the pandemic. Um, this was a huge increase. So pre-COVID in December 2019, the number of unique customer accounts receiving G2P payments was 700,000. This increased to 1 million by March of 2020 and then swelled to 2.9 million by June of 2020. Um, this was the global kind of growth, but I think it's notable just to mention that Latin America has traditionally had a higher, a disproportionately higher percentage of G2P payments in relation to other forms of bulk payments. And uh, interestingly, I think this was the region that we realized the largest growth and the largest number of recipients of mobile money enabled government payments. Thank you, Ashley, for that uh, global picture. Now, I wanted to hear from Milka, Milka um, in East Africa there. What was happening in terms of social payments, the sort of, the sort of patterns that you were seeing, maybe mobile net money or not mobile money? Um, can you give us some insights there? I think especially from um, the Kenyan perspective, there were uh, certainly, uh, you know, uh, increase in the number of uh, vulnerable needs that arose uh, during the pandemic. And there were emerging uh, population that were not in social protection before, 
like the urban sector, the urban settlements, uh, people who have lost their jobs, and, 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 and not just the numbers, but even in terms of increasing budgets, um, government had to expand the, the fiscal space to be able to, to increase the, 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 the number of uh, people that access the, the cash transfers during that pandemic time. Um, but more importantly, there were a mix of delivery channels in terms of mobile money and in terms of um, uh, using existing systems that had already be, been defined for, for social protection. Yeah. Thank you very much. And now, um, see, every time I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I want to introduce my panelists because they, they come from these big organizations. Um, and I'll, I'll now move to you, Michael. And I know you're from Mukuru. And I know recently you, you guys now are partnering with humanitarians or other government agencies to distribute aid. So please tell us how you came about to having this uh, division of wills within Mukuru, which is traditionally remittances and um, describe some of the operational issues to do with social protection payments that you guys are solving. Sure, thanks, um, Tura. I think it's quite a, a timely question and uh, I think it might provide a slightly different uh, viewpoint from, from some of the panel. Um, yeah, if you don't mind, I'm going to answer it a bit more broadly, uh, covering diaspora remittances alongside social protection disbursements um, as they share distribution networks and I also believe the free market uh, provides valuable insights into the question of financial inclusion. More specifically, uh, the question touches on sort of the false dichotomy of cash versus digital when they're both necessary enablers along the same journey. Uh, so just uh, thanks for the intro, but uh, to provide some brief context for my views, because I don't speak for the whole of Africa, uh, particularly the southern aspect. Uh, I head up uh, commercial for Makuru, so we're the largest uh, international money transfer provider in southern Africa, uh, servicing over 9 million vulnerable migrant diaspora. Uh, we operate an extensive African network of over 300,000 owned and partner cash dis uh, disbursement locations across 21 countries, uh, alongside the region's leading bank, transfer and mobile wallet solutions. Uh, so I think we're in a fairly decent space uh, to see from a free market perspective and obviously from the social um, transfer and humanitarian aid perspective, uh, what works and uh, in the field. So our primary reason for being is to assist the hardworking diaspora support their loved ones back home. So formalizing the informal, who often require specific assistance in terms of uh, functional, financial, and technical literacy to reach that first rung of financial inclusion. Uh, so from, as I said, from a typically Africa perspective, uh, when the first national lockdowns began, uh, you know, we expected a significant downturn in remittances and a pivot from cash to digital in key territories. Uh, with movement restrictions and their knock-on effect to livelihoods, the migrant diaspora were limited in their ability to support their families back home. Uh, so the importance of social cash transfers in particular as a key lifeline and supporter of upward social mobility uh, was clearly highlighted. Similarly, the resilience of value transfer networks was tested at a scale not seen in most of our lifetimes. Uh, so in response, Makuru reviewed its network prioritizations. We had had an enterprise uh, platform that we've been building for about a year, year and a half. Uh, and obviously when the pandemic hit, it became uh, more relevant. So uh, we were preparing for the impending digital swing and spent a considerable amount of time re-engineering processes for, its regional, for our regional sales and operations teams uh, in excess of 3,000 people to ensure their safety and also the continuity of service for our customers. So quite a feat. Uh, our country entities were declared essential services, which was key to ongoing trade during lockdowns, and we were very fortunate to have an extremely diverse network of pay-in and pay-out partners that were able to keep trading across formal and informal sectors. Uh, interestingly, the mass migration to digital, um, unlike other parts of the Northern Hemisphere and uh, North and Central uh, or Siwa, uh, for the most part, uh, we did not see that digital migration uh, materialize. Sort of post a, a short period of reduced activity in April 2020, uh, a month of peak uncertainty, our transfer volumes increased dramatically and cash transfers continued to dominate. Uh, informal senders, normally utilizing taxis and buses to transfer their funds, were left with no option but to use formal remittance means. The vast majority have stayed with Makuru since, which, uh, you know, it was, uh, even after the easing of restrictions, which is quite transformational in itself. The continued dominance of cash transfers, though, in a free market and at a time when value retention would argue be at, be at its greatest. Uh, was a clear example of customers voting with their feet. So we've often heard this, you know, the, the, imminent, the imminent demise of cash, but to sort of paraphrase Mark Twain, the rumors of its death are greatly exaggerated, at least in a Southern African context. So while the positives of digital value stores are undisputed, Makuru is firmly committed to building robust digital rails, 
most Southern African markets are simply not ready for purely, and I, I really do emphasize purely, digital transfers across urban and rural geographies. Makuru, for instance, operates um, a next generation financial services platform providing emerging customers with a transformative digital journey. So it's a fully digital platform, uh, but with a choice of digital and cash value stores uh, on either end of the transaction. Uh, choice is truly empowering and the free market decides how best to maintain the greatest value along that transmission chain. Putting the proverbial cart before the horse, you know, forcing digital disbursements, even with all the best intentions, often leaves the recipient bearing the cost of digital cash conversion, which is required uh, until digital merchant ecosystems reach the levels we see in the likes of Kenya. So during the pandemic, uh, you know, we were fortunate enough to work with UN agencies and leading NGOs to distribute uh, much needed funds to recipients in you know, key territories of ours, such as Zimbabwe, Malawi, uh, Botswana, Zambia, Lesotho, Mozambique, amongst others, uh, where we could offer a ubiquitous national cash distribution footprint, cash remittances resulted in far greater value retention by recipients. And so, again, I'm nowhere disputing the end goal for fully digital end-to-end -end transactions, uh, but the flow of funds needs to be tracked through the recipient's mobile wallet and into the merchant's hands for there to be true transformation for both the recipient of the funds and the small business owner. The crew is presently rolling out its mobile wallet and card products across Southern Africa and tends to, uh, we hope, to be an active participant in building these robust digital ecosystems. All right. And Dekelo, do you see the same trends in Nigeria? Um, I know that the success of digital financial services is, is actually to make it an alternative to cash. What sort of trends did you see in Nigeria? So, I mean, I think the experience was slightly different in Nigeria. Nigeria was already on a journey, to, uh, social protection journey, with a program that was already reaching over 13 million people. So when the pandemic started, it was a totally different case. It was really to scale up a lot of the things that were already in flight. And so in that case, unlike some other countries where they had to rapidly adopt digital delivery of benefits or social protection programs, it was quite different in Nigeria. But I think on a broader scale, the bigger value of the pandemic is the fact that those who were more resistant to change of adopting digital methods, agent networks, leveraging mobile payments, trying cards, engaging and investing in the user education that would really, really promote digital delivery of social benefits, they didn't have a choice. And I think that was the biggest opportunity that the pandemic actually gave. Thank you. Well, thank you, Daikola. Um, and I now move to something else that's critical for social cash transfers, that's your beneficiary register and trying to identify who is supposed to get this and is the right person getting the social protection that they need. So Milka, can you tell us how digital identity played a part during the pandemic, post-pandemic, um, what is happening in East Africa or Kenya? Thank you. Thank you. I, th I think first to set the context that uh, Kenya is really opportune uh, being the first mover advantage on the M-Pesa rollout uh, since 2007. And secondly, Kenya's quest for financial inclusion paid off with uh, quite some form of financial inclusion at 83 happening. And therefore, this is quite important in terms of uh, increasing uh, digital delivery of social payments. Mobile phone ownership is also high across the country. But also the fact that um, Kenya's identity systems is quite developed. We have quite a different uh, a number of uh, data registries. For example, within the social protection system, we have a very developed uh, a single registry that holds the data for all the uh, recipients for, for, for social payments and others that are also uh, receiving other government uh, payments. We also have the government validating system, the ID system that the banks usually use or the fintechs normally use to validate recipients of, of social protection. So in terms of uh, digital usage during pandemic, uh, there are two ways. One is that the social protection itself uh, developed its own biometric system authentication, both at onboarding the customer and also at authenticating for payments. It was already developed and it was just, you know, adding more payments into those that are already in the existing systems. But other than that, again, the, the worst deployment of mobile money during the period, and like I mentioned, M-Pesa, Airtel, and many other mobile networks already present in the country. And so it was quite in, uh, easier, I would say, than some countries that are still evolving 
in terms of mobile money. But I would say a bit of caution in terms of it's okay to be digitally present and ready, but we need to be careful around those that are not already um, within the digital frame so that we don't create some iniquities or some exclusion for those, for example, who do not have any mobile phones or those who do not have accessibility to that. But more importantly, the, the, the role the private sector played, the role the regulator like the central bank played in enabling all this infrastructure to march together during the pandemic was quite impressive. For example, central bank coming in to to weigh in on the charges and, and, and commissions that are charged for, for transactions during that period. And, and, and the banks and the, and, and, and the service providers providing liquidity across the sector, even though there are places, pockets of country places that we know liquidity did not carry in there to, to serve the, the people who are you know, most in need. But overall, there are lessons learned there. Uh, for example, um, just the question you mentioned, how do we know the right person is receiving? The biometric really played a, a, a big role in terms of identifying and providing proof of life as to who really is the right person to receive the money and, and, and identification around ensuring that uh, the right people receive the, 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 the cash that was being delivered there. But it wasn't government alone that came into this were quite partners, donor partners that came into this private sector, you know, uh, Ministry of Health, there were just a lot of stakeholder collaboration, a lot of stakeholder coordination to make things happen fast, you know, uh, in view of the pandemic. Um, and, and, and we have learned a lot of lessons, for example, in terms of so what then? It's very important to have data of those that are vulnerable because it became an issue at some point to identify, to get out there during social distancing time to look for those that we felt were uh, quite vulnerable. So I think uh, lessons from, from the pandemic is that it's good to have a social registry and, and just have data sitting there waiting in case of any shock uh, uh, pandemic like what happened. And again, we are not just talking about the COVID-19 pandemic. We should also be talking about any other shock responses like the climate change, you know, Africa, we are born of that, <laughs> uh, rain, floods, uh, you know, drought. So the government, again, Kenya is really working towards a more comprehensive social protection that is more shock responsive to the emerging uh, uh, crisis that is happening across the world. Thank you. Thank you. And I know that social, uh, social payments um, need to be resilient and post COVID, has taught us and so many lessons on how to be resilient. And I want Ashley to comment on that from a global perspective, how digital identity, maybe across regions or maybe pick a region, how it actually played a role in making social payments resilient. Has there been growth or lack thereof? What are we doing from a GSMA point of view, which has that many stakeholders looking into this? Yeah, thanks, Tariro. I mean, certainly the infrastructure of EKYC systems, access to IDs and ID infrastructure is one of the biggest challenges affecting mobile money adoption. So pandemic or no pandemic, it, it is a big challenge. And I think it's something that we watched carefully during the pandemic. We saw some really positive regulatory changes in some countries where there was maybe you know, already discussion and, and sort of progress towards developing EKYC uh, systems that then were accelerated due to the pandemic. Um, currently, 42 of the Sub-Saharan African countries reviewed under our mobile money regulatory index, um, 11 of those 42 have EKYC infrastructures. Ultimately, you know, financial regulators who are formulating the KYC regulations based these on available forms of ID. So, so when there is a digital ID verification system within a country, it can really improve the onboarding process. Um, and then I think just rightly, as, as Milka mentioned, it actually offers the opportunity to link systems together to facilitate the transmittal of information and make identity verification more automatic and secure and using multiple modes of, of data for, for um, identity. This ultimately makes it easier and more seamless and cost efficient for governments to reach the right people with social cash payments in times of crises. And so the work to be done ahead of time and getting these foundational systems and infrastructure in place is really important to be able to act swiftly. Um, we've seen a couple of good 
you know, new elements on, on digital identity. So both in Tanzania and in Nigeria, we've seen some positive progress on digital IDs and linking this with the mobile network operators, the telecom authorities, et cetera. And I think that's a really positive um, development that we've seen in this space to link the KYC and the digital IDs. Thank you, Ashley. And um, the reason why we governments or agencies do social protection is really for SDG one, right? Moving people out of poverty, having countries um, on a path to inclusive growth. So my question to you, Dakola, and to everybody else on the panel is, what, discuss, let's talk about social protection actually as a tool for inclusive growth. Has that really happened in Nigeria? And I know that Dakola, you're also a subject matter expert on our digitizing humanitarian and social assistance course. So tell us, how do we use social protection to have inclusive growth in a country? Um, thank you very much, Tari. I, I think that you know, the case for social protection is a unique one in Africa. Uh, the recent report by Development Aid says suggests that about 36% of people in Africa are living in extreme poverty. I don't think we have much of a choice in terms of implementing social protection strategies. It's actually a need. And from that point of view, we've seen a number of countries take this more seriously. Um, governments have been supported by a lot of international partners and players to try and create more sustainable long-term social protection programs instead of having interventions. And Nigeria, for example, started a program about six years ago. And over the years, that has gone from reaching about what, maybe 3 million people plus in cash transfers, feeding up to 10 million children every day in schools, across creating jobs for over a million people, a million young people as well, and giving loans to over another 2 million people. And these various programs are all designed to address different elements of social protection. But I think the private sector has a huge role to play because to really achieve sustainability and use social protection as a tool for inclusive growth, the services that are accessible to the poor and vulnerable or those who are disadvantaged need to be designed for that sector. And I say that because one of the bigger barriers, for example, in the case of financial services, is the fact that the way modern banks or commercial banks deliver services is very different from the way it needs to be consumed by somebody who lives in a rural or a smaller scale environment. The costs and the perception of those costs is also very different depending on what layer of the social strata you're dealing with. And so there are definitely a number of products that need to be designed specifically with the social protection agenda in mind to enhance that. And unless we have dedicated strategies to address these layers of the um, economy or the population, it's just going to be difficult to include everyone. So for example, I work with Sabi Africa and Sabi Africa's mission really is to digitize informal trade. And in doing that, there are a number of things that you want to focus on. We look at exactly what tools are necessary to bridge the gap between a small informal business and a modern business. We look at exactly what data is required to be able to offer more advanced services to them without complicating the access to that, without requiring too much on their, on their side. We look at what information in terms of identity to piggyback on what um, Chebi said as well in those layers so that we're dealing with them based on requirements that are actually accessible and not what is impossible. And then you go further to see that it's not just the fact that the informal trade or the smaller sector of the economy, the small businesses and informal traders um, are at a disadvantage and they require additional services. It's also the fact that all the way across the value chain, there are certain disadvantages that are inherent in terms of competitive pricing that you have to consider in terms of the range of tools, access to credit. And it's really been a much overlooked site because it's the more difficult part of the economy to look into. And I see social protection as a unique opportunity because somebody is willing to make an investment for the bigger picture 
rather than the profits or the you know the the margins that you can earn from that and that gives it creates the demand in some way for other private sector players to act in there so from where i sit i think social protection is a necessary tool within africa at least for us to use and in every other developing continent where you can find as well and there's a huge um, opportunity for collaboration between the private sector, government, and development actors. Thank you. Well, thank you, Daikola. And I think uh, it's, it's, it's important that agencies, maybe who might come in with their program, to use local partners and grow those partners, local merchants, and grow their business within that country so the economic development to improve or add on to the economic development of that local uh, part of the country, in turn, the, the country itself. But I, I wanted Mike to, to comment on this as well. Um, inclusive growth. What have you seen in your, in terms of social payments, even remittances, how has it improved the, the economic development of the country? Sure, thanks, sir. Uh, and I also see we're running a little bit low on time, so I'll keep this short so maybe we can, we can uh, squeeze in a question or two. Um, but look, I mean, we're preaching to the choir. You know, this is uh, social protection, you know, see as a necessary incubator for upward social mobility. Um, you know, you reinforce that base of the pyramid um, and it builds a strong foundation for all of these, you know, implementation of these progressive and resilient programs for uh, inclusive growth. Uh, and some of the best examples are where the public and private sector work together. So, you know, the likes of Kenya and, and Nigeria are standouts, you know, as you head further down to Southern Africa, there is still a lot to learn and we're a bit further back on that journey. Um, but it will be that uh, collaboration between the public and private sector, I think, that makes us, um, makes us a catalyst uh, for leaps and bounds. But, you know, we need to make sure that we are incentivizing the right part of the value chain, uh, which I kind of alluded to earlier, and I know Milka okay, touched on, and Daikola and Ashley as well. I mean, we, we're basically looking at, uh, from my perspective, might be a bit myopic, but the merchant perspective need a fully digital ecosystem that will act as a, as a carrot to draw people into that approach rather than, I suppose, a stick of, you know, forcing people into a specific value chain that may have a lot of friction. And for us, really, to build that strong foundation, we need to make sure that we have value retention along that chain. When we're transmitting value, and I'm, I'm not being absolutely specific here around cash, because it could be goods, it could be gross, it could be anything, but it's value that's being transmitted um, that ultimately converts into nutrition, opportunities, empowerment. Uh, and that's why we're all here. And I think working together, we can, uh, you know, I think this panel even, uh, I'm very nice to meet you all. And I hope that, uh, you know, there's a way for us to work together at some point. Um, I think we, you know, we're part of the choir here. Thanks, Rue. Thank you, Mike. And I'm just going to direct another question at you. It's, it's actually a Zimbabwe question. And it's coming from Gerald, who is um, one of our committee members of the Alliance. And I'll just summarize it. It says the existence of a parallel market for Forex makes demand for cash at the last mile very high. To Mike, is there scope for Mukuru to set up merchant services within their agencies to try and manage this demand for cash? Watch this space. Um, we're currently, so I, I, I didn't say it lightly when um, I said we want to hopefully become somewhat thought leaders in Southern Africa in terms of building these digital ecosystems, uh, obviously working with partners and government. Uh, we have a very active digital base in South Africa. Uh, we have over a quarter million uh, mobile wallet holders, and we are currently uh, launching in the likes of Botswana, Zimbabwe, uh, Malawi. They will all eventually get a form of digital store of value and potentially plastic, whatever is required for that ecosystem and what's relevant at that time. Uh, but yes, absolutely, uh, Zimbabwe is quite a unicorn uh, in terms of it is sort of Kenya of the South, but by different means, uh, if I can call it that. Uh, but it comes with its own, you know, uh, its own opportunities and uh, friction points that we have to work through. So we're quite adept at doing that. And there are lots of discussions underway to make sure that we can provide the most value to the customers at the end of the day. Thank you, Mike. And I know that we have only like a minute left, but I really wanted Ashley, I'm picking on you, to just tell us the importance of G2P payments as a form, um, as, uh, as a form of improving people's livelihoods and just in general digital financial services. Yeah, absolutely. I'll try to be pretty quick, but I mean, 
governments have a huge role to play, right? So if they start to digitize GDP payments and using mobile money or digital channels to deploy social protection um, uh, cash payment or payments, they are ultimately bringing people into the fold of financial inclusion that have previously been excluded. And I think really right now our challenge is to ensure that governments don't revert to cash. So those that we saw to pick up momentum during the pandemic because it was required, you know, we, we have seen some, some markets where this is starting to revert back to cash and we need to keep the momentum because of this little role that governments play to really continue to digitize payments in this economy. Thank you very much to my panel, our panel. It's, so, it's been so great um, having this conversation, a very important conversation. And I hope that within our audience, they can go back, whether they work in public sector or private sector or the development and improve G2P payments for the development of countries and people. So I'm going to end this session. Thank you for joining the Future of Social Cash Payment session. And uh, we'll see you in the next uh, sessions of Hot 2017 Summit. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yes.